Hey guys, this is K2's Retro Workshop. Today we're going to revisit this 386SX motherboard that I updated with a 486SLC. In the original video that I did of this board, we figured out that the oscillator on here determined the clock frequency and it ended up with a 40 megahertz overclock from the 33 megahertz labeling on this Cyrix. It ran perfectly fine. It gave us a huge performance increase, but I wanted to see just how far I could take it. So I've done a few things here. I've desoldered the original oscillator and put in a socket, and now there's a 100 megahertz oscillator in here. That runs the CPU at 50 megahertz. I went ahead and added a heat sink, you can see right there, to the processor because even at 40 megahertz it was running pretty hot. I thought about putting this crazy tall flashy one on there, but decided I wanted to be able to use the ISA slot potentially in the future. The AT clock is determined by two jumpers here and how you set them up just depends on how much it divides the bus clock. So what I've done is I've gone and I've changed it and I've actually ended up at the lowest divider it'll do. So in these benchmarks, I've got a 50 megahertz overclock on a 33 megahertz processor. I've got zero weight states on my 60 nanosecond SIMS. And my ISA bus is running at 20 megahertz versus the original 8.3. Um, surprisingly enough, my uh, Sing 4000 video card does not care. I can even run it at zero weight states at that high frequency. And I'm not getting any hard drive corruption because this I.O. controller is rare in that it doesn't seem to care either. So, yeah, let's take a look at the benchmarks compared to before and see what kind of numbers we've come up with. There are comparisons to the original SX in the first video I made about this motherboard and I've got it linked below if you're interested in just how much of an upgrade this processor was in the first place. Our first slide here gives a good overview of the gains we've gotten so far with this setup. Gray is the 386SX, orange is our clock for clock replacement with the 486SLC, and blue is the 486SLC overclocked to 50MHz with an ISA bus of 20MHz. You might think this is an unfair comparison, but it should be noted that going from 10 megahertz to 20 megahertz on the ISA bus doesn't give nearly the gain you would expect. I only saw about 5% gain in performance by overclocking that far, and not everything even sees this gain. PC player, for example, doesn't change at all. This mostly has to do with how many frames have to move through the ISA bus. PC player is a low frame rate and therefore less data moves to the video card, so we see less of a gain with this overclock versus 3D Bench that gets higher frame rates and therefore spends more time doing ISA transfers. Omdahl's Law in action. This seems to also coincide with the findings on the CPU Galaxy Channel 2. He installs a 386DX in a VESA local bus motherboard that supports it. Bandwidth increases drastically to the expansion cards, but benchmark performance hardly changes at all. This happens because the CPU is, and always has been, the bigger bottleneck of these systems. On the next slide, I've added a couple of 386DX results. These results are provided by Ethiatos, a fellow YouTuber that is doing some great hardware mods on his 386 system to try and squeeze out every bit of performance he can from the platform from making custom 45 nanosecond sims to modding in an unheard of 256 kilobytes of cache. I put a link to his channel in the box below. As you can see, the 386SX is the slowest. Big surprise, no cache at all. Ahead of that is the stock optimized 386DX though, not the 486SLC as one would expect giving the much smaller cache and half the external data lines. The SLC holds it on with less than one frame per second between them, but when the DX and SLC get clocked to 50 MHz, the performance spread gets pretty big. Remember, PC player wasn't affected by the ISA overclock, and it was only good for about one FPS in 3D Bench. Finally, we have a comparison of the overclocked and optimized systems head to head. The first on the list is the memory bandwidth results, which may seem fishy, 
but the 32-bit bus doesn't necessarily translate to twice the bandwidth. A stock 386SX will get about 17 megabytes per second on this test, so it's in the ballpark of these two results as well. Interesting that the chip with half the memory data lines could come out ahead, but that's what we have. Next, we have video bandwidth. This is really just a test of the ISA clock speed. 16 versus 32-bit data transfers don't matter for this test because ISA is a 16-bit bus. So it's pretty straightforward comparison. Processor benchmark is next, and this is where it gets a little interesting. This is an excellent show of cache performance differences. It isn't on there, but for the record, the 40 megahertz, the 40 megahertz SX got a six on this benchmark. And the SLC at the same got 40 megahertz, got an even 20. The SLC absolutely decimates the DX and the SX here with its score being essentially half of its clock speed. I'll talk more about this in detail in a bit. Doom, the ultimate benchmark. The DX leaves a bit to be desired here still, but the SLC is starting to actually get into territory of playable at max resolution. I tend to do the minimum benchmark on these old systems because it's easier to compare larger numbers with less rounding error, and the result of that benchmark was 39.1. So somewhere between minimum and maximum is a large window with a very playable 20 FPS. Playable Doom on a 386 class system. Shh, crazy. I'm going to play some benchmark comparisons here while I talk about the performance differences. I have a theory as to why there is such a large difference, and that is the cache situation. The 386DX has cache on the motherboard. This is nice because you can offset the cost of the processor, make a lower cost system by not installing the cache, and leaving it as an option for the customer. But this is also with some drawbacks. Because the cache is external, the CPU must abide by standard timing specifications for the memory that can go in that slot. While it is faster access than RAM, to the tune of about twice as fast normally from what I've seen, the inability to totally optimize this process isn't there and therefore slows it down. The 486 SLC, however, has cache via a tightly coupled on die one kilobyte. According to the data sheet, cache access is two clock cycles faster than external memory access. On top of that, the processor isn't hindered by the 16-bit external data bus for cache hits because just like the 386SX, the 486SLC is 32 bits internally. The 486 instruction set in the SLC I don't think would make a big difference across the board unless everything tested here utilizes them. They might, but I highly doubt that's the case. Now, the ability of this processor to do 50 megahertz when it's been labeled 33 has me wondering if this processor maybe isn't built on the same process as the SLC250 chip with just the doubler either missing or disabled. It wasn't uncommon to do this for lesser chips back then, like the early 486SX chips being DX chips with bad math processor sections which were disabled and then sold as SX. With this in mind, it's possible the 50 MHz core clock might not be a real overclock if the core was designed to run 50 MHz. I've got a 133 MHz oscillator on the Slowbo from China that would give me 66 MHz core clock. I'm not holding my breath on that one just yet. 50 MHz is already 25% above the rated speed of this motherboard, and 66 MHz may not work. That's actually twice the labeled speed on this processor. I may need some faster sims to hit that target, but I can add weight states if I need to, I think, for that one. One last oddity about this chip. Normally, these SLC chips were plastic with their info screen printed on the top, but this particular chip was a blank ceramic package with nothing but a sticker on it. To be honest, it could be almost anything. Part of me does kind of feel like this might not be a fair comparison of processors because the one kilobyte of cache really does change the name of the game. That being said, the DX platform isn't maxed out here. We had the battle of the soldered in processors, but the DX platform has the TI 486 DLC and the Cyrix 486 DRX266 as upgrades that utilize the same 486 instructions and internal cache benefits. 
I'm going to revisit those with maximum optimization and overclocking and see how they compare to the SLC. If I remember right, they don't take overclocking very well, so there might still be a winner in the SLC, but we will find out when my oscillator and everything comes in. I know it's been a while since my last video, but I've started having to travel for work again. Out of the last five weeks, I've spent one at home. It sounds great, but that was finals week. I'm also a full-time student going into my senior year of my bachelor's in electronics engineering, so things have been busy to say the least. I'm actually recording this voiceover from the bathroom of my hotel. The floor is tile in the main room and it echoes like crazy, so I had to hang towels all over the place and I'll put a picture of that up right now to deaden the echoing and allow me to get this video out to you. Anyways, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below and I will see you next time.